This video is going to be on anticoagulation and anticoagulant drugs. So we have our whole pathway laid out here. Intrinsic, extrinsic, fibrinolytic. This is the whole shebang. Now, we're going to talk about how we make coagulation factors in the first place. It's made in our liver, as is most things. So the liver makes all coag factors. Now certain factors like 2, 7, 9, 10, and then anti-coag factors like CNS um, need vitamin K in particular. So these need vitamin K. And vitamin K activates these. It activates them because it has an enzyme called gamma glutamyl carboxylase. So reduced vitamin K will turn inactive factors and activate them via gamma glutamyl carboxylase. And in turn, reduced vitamin K becomes oxidized vitamin K. AKA epoxide. And epoxide, oxidized vitamin K can't work anymore, that's not good. So our liver, being a friend it is, will recycle it back to reduce vitamin K with the help of epoxide reductase. That's a fitting name. Basically reduces epoxide to make reduced vitamin K and then it can recycle and start all over again. And that is the importance of the factors 2, 7, 9, 10, and C and S. They need vitamin K. So that's how your liver makes and regulates all your factors. If you, if you have a decrease in these coagulation factors, then you have a problem making clots, so you'll, you'll bleed. So uh, signs of a decreased coagulation factors are, are bleeding, but that's not very helpful. We talked about if you're missing platelets and you'll also bleed. How can you tell the difference between bleeding from a problem in primary hemostasis, aka platelets, and uh, bleeding that comes from secondary hemostasis, aka coagulation factors? Well, you can tell clinically because uh, bleeding from primary hemostasis is a problem with making that initial platelet plug. Well, if you can't make that platelet plug, you're going to have early bleeding. You're also going to have superficial bleeding. So epistaxis, you're going to have bleeding in your skin, very superficial bleeding because you can't make that initial plug. So primary hemostasis, early and superficial bleeding. Secondary hemostasis, on the other hand, you can make that plug. It's just a, a temporary plug. It's, a, it's not a very sturdy one. So you won't have the early bleeding. You won't have superficial bleeding because you can make that plug. However, um, that plug can dislodge and you can have late bleeding and deep bleeding. So post-surgery, you can be fine and then suddenly you start to develop bleeding or you can have bleeding into your joints, hemo, hemarthrosis. So really late and really deep bleeding. So you can tell it clinically, but you know, you know that can be hit or miss sometimes. So a better way to tell it is through laboratory tests. And the two laboratory tests we do is gonna be PTT and PT. It's a bane of a lot of students who exist. Oh, by the way, uh, APTT and PTT are the same thing, so don't get confused. But PTT and PT are our two tests. Now PT evaluates in particular coagulation factor seven. What pathway does this factor reside in? If you say extrinsic pathway, you are correct. So PT is the one that evaluates your extrinsic pathway. PTT evaluates a ton of coag factors, including all of these, including 10. So we just call it intrinsic. It's like, <laughs> it's perfect, right? So PTT evaluates your intrinsic factors. PTT. And by doing that, we can see what exactly is going wrong. And that way we can see where the problem is coming from, where the bleeding is coming from. So used in conjunction with our platelet bleeding test, do you remember what that test was? If you said bleeding time, you're right. We can tell whether the bleeding is due to a platelet problem or due to a coagulation problem, even down to the, I guess, the, the pathway, intrinsic or extrinsic pathway, okay? So that's how we can use our lab findings to tell what's the source of our bleeding. 
Now, what can cause decreased coagulation factors and bleeding? Well, you can have a liver disease because your liver makes your coag factors. You can have vitamin K deficiency, um, usually from malabsorption uh, also. A lot of your vitamin K, especially starting out when you're a baby, is made from gut bacteria. Yeah, gut bacteria makes a lot of vitamin K, so babies, when they're born, they don't have a lot of gut bacteria. That's why we give them intramuscular vitamin K, just so they don't start bleeding out. Um, in adults, usually more seen in malabsorption, but you can have decreased gut bacteria if you're taking prolonged antibiotics. Biotics, that's a common test question. They'll talk about a patient who's doing fine, gets, in, gets an infection and starts taking a drug or antibiotic, and then now their PT and their PTT is through the roof. Why? Look for decreased gut bacteria or vitamin K deficiency because of that. Okay, that's a common way I like to ask it. So liver disease can cause decreased coagulation factors and then bleeding. Vitamin K deficiency can cause decreased coagulation factors and bleeding. But it doesn't have to be pathological. In fact, sometimes we want to stop this whole pathway and stop making clots. Why would we do that? Well, if a patient is hypercoagulable, if the patient has pulmonary embolus or something, then we don't want this pathway to go on. We actually want to uh, make it harder for them to create clots, make it easier for them to bleed. So drugs that do this, we call anticoagulants. You're stopping coagulation. Anticoagulants. One of the big ones is heparin. Heparin is via IV or intramuscular. Heparin is very short acting. So our heparin, which shouldn't surprise you, it is IV, uh, fast acting. And the mechanism of heparin is it loves to bind antithrombin-3. A throwback to a lesson that I just taught. Hopefully you remember what antithrombin-3 does. Antithrombin-3 inhibits a lot of coagulation factors, in particular 2 and 10. And we said those are important because 2 is thrombin, the thing that makes fibrinogen into fibrin, and then 10 is the one that uh, all the other pathways converge onto. Yeah? So it binds antithrombin-3, causes a conformational change, and actually activates and increases the activity of antithrombin-3. And by doing that, we stop coagulation. Something you should know about heparin, heparin does not cross the placenta. So it does not cross the placenta. Pregnant women are hypercoagulable by, by evolution because bleeding out has been a very high cause of, of maternal mortality. So they're hypercoagulable um, by design. So it's common to see pregnant women that have like DVTs or pulmonary embolus, et cetera. So if a patient comes in and they're pregnant and they ask you what drug you give them, heparin is a good choice because it does not cross the placenta, it doesn't harm the baby, and it's an anticoagulant. So know that well. I've seen a lot of questions on that. Some side effects, you're gonna have bleeding because that's what it does. Um, other side effects, we talked about drug-induced, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, so don't forget about that. Osteoporosis is a big one, especially in prolonged use. The, the mechanism of which is still not well understood. It seems to activate osteoclast and rank L expression more. So it causes bone breakdown and osteoporosis with prolonged use. In the acute setting, it's usually not a problem. How do you want to reverse it if you're having an overdose? If you accidentally give them too much or, or if a patient takes too much of heparin, then you reverse it with protamine sulfate. Protamine sulfate is just a positively charged protein, but heparin is a very strong negatively charged protein, so binds heparin kind of reverses it. You should notice very well. I've seen a lot of questions on that also. In fact, any of these antidotes, know them well. Um, antidotes are a common, common test question. Now, we never want to get to the state where we're overdosing on our patients on heparin, so, so we follow heparin very closely with one of our coag test, PTT and PT. Which one do you think follows heparin? Would it be PT or would it be PTT? Well, we said heparin works on antithrombin-3, which, which works on 2 and 10. The only one that works on 10 is going to be PTT. So we follow heparin with PTT. There's a different form of heparin called low molecular weight heparin. Heparin is a polysaccharide, low, low molecular weight heparin is just the polysaccharide with low less chains. It works better on 
factor 10, so it likes factor 10 more. However, it likes factor 2 less. Um, it's great because it doesn't really require monitoring as much you can do it more on an outpatient basis. Uh, the problem is, is that it's not as easily reversible because it binds factor 10 so much that you can't um, give protamine sulfate that positive charge and try and take it away because it just, it just likes you know, um, anti-thrombin 3 and factor 10 that much more. So just know um, the pros and cons of low molecular weight heparin. We're going to move on to our next drug and that is direct 10 inhibitors. All these have an X in their name, kind of like the X in 10. So that makes it easy. Um, things like a PIX uh, band. So that X right in the middle makes it easy to, to recognize it. Blocks 10 directly. Not much to know about it because it's still being tested clinically. So just know how to recognize it and what it does. Yeah, they might give you this drug name and then ask you what the mechanism is. It directly blocks factor 10. You can have another drug that directly blocks a coag factor. And that'd be direct thrombin inhibitor for factor two. We sure are harping a lot on factor two and factor 10 because they're that important. Factor 2 is what makes fibrinogen a fibrin. Factor 10 is what all the pathways converge into. That's why they're so important. That's, that's why heparin hits it. That's why direct X inhibitors hit it. That's why this hits it. So everything kind of hits these two uh, coag factors because they're that important. So direct thrombin inhibitors block thrombin. And there's a couple um, different drug names. A lot of them end in Gatron, but that's not always the case. One of the big ones is bivalirudin. The word rudin, rudin is an uh, anticoagulant that leeches use and then we realized, well, that works pretty darn well. So we kind of incorporated that. That's where the rudin comes from. But it blocks factor two, so thrombin. And it's used if a patient has heparin allergy and you don't want to give them heparin. So it's, it's great in that, in that regard. Last but not least, I want to talk about warfarin. Warfarin is a big one. Warfarin is basically the opposite of heparin. So warfarin, whereas heparin was IV and IM, warfarin is oral, whereas heparin is, is short acting and it has a short half-life, warfarin is long acting and has a long half-life. So there's a lot of opposites. Um, warfarin blocks epoxide reductase blocks epoxide reductase. What does that do? Can you remind me? We just talked about it. Epoxide reductase turns epoxide, aka oxidized vitamin K, back to the reduced form, right? It recycles it. And that way the recycled vitamin K can go and activate more factors namely factor two, two, seven, nine, ten. Then without those factors, then you can't make uh, a clot and that's why it's an anticoagulant. That's how warfarin works. Just a warning, a lot of questions I've seen on warfarin have to do with overdoses. So a, a child goes into their grandparents' cabinet and takes too much warfarin. <clears throat> or if they eat rat poison, rat poison is just warfarin, so they'll, they'll bleed out, the rat will bleed out, and if the kid eats too much, the kid will bleed out. And just be aware that it's due to blocking epoxide reductase and a decrease in these factors. But back to warfarin, again, warfarin is like the opposite of heparin where heparin didn't cross the placenta, warfarin does. So you definitely don't wanna give it to a pregnant woman. Warfarin not only crosses the placenta, but it's teratogenic, teratogenic. And whereas heparin, you monitor it with PTT because it affected factor 10, Warfarin, you monitor it with something else. What do you think we monitor it with? Well, we don't have two choices, so uh, it makes it pretty easy. We monitor it with PT. So why do we use PT? Warfarin makes two, seven, nine, and 10. Seven is over here, yeah. And nine is over here. So it actually works on both pathways. Why do we use PT? Well, we notice in therapeutic normal doses of warfarin, it predominantly affects PT. That's why we use it here. 
And if you're at really, really, really high doses, then it'll affect both. But for our intents and purposes, warfarin mainly affects PT, and that's how we monitor our warfarin use. Make sure we don't give too much. Make sure we don't overdose the patient. If we do overdose the patient, or if the uh, patient takes too much, like the, the kid that got into the cabinet, then we can reverse warfarin use. How do you think we'll reverse it? We can reverse it by giving the kid or the patient fresh frozen plasma and that plasma has all the coagulation factors we're missing so that'll stop the bleeding. That's immediate. Yeah. Uh, a longer term thing we can do is give them vitamin K and that'll just kind of replenish the vitamin K. Vitamin K takes a while. So in a question stem, if a patient is acutely bleeding and they're gonna bleed out, don't give them vitamin K. That'd be the wrong answer because that takes a while. Give them fresh frozen plasma. So that was warfarin. Now you're probably thinking, I talked about 2, 7, 9, and 10, but I skipped C and S. Why did I do that? Well, I did that on purpose because there's a very big side effect of giving warfarin. Warfarin blocks epoxide reductase, right? That makes 2, 7, 9, 10, and C and S. And I didn't talk about it here because I wanted to talk about it when we're talking about the side effect of warfarin. When you block all of these, C and S actually has the shortest half-life, so that gets blocked first. And you'll have a period where you just have these coagulation factors, but nothing to regulate it. And so there's a, there's a short period where you're just very, very, very hyper-coagulable. And because they're so hypercoagulable, then you can have thromboforming and it can cause necrosis on your body, especially your skin. So you can have skin necrosis. That's called warfarin skin necrosis and it is a very big side effect you should know. Warfarin skin necrosis. And it's because C and S, which regulate your coagulation, decrease quicker than anything else. And so no, you're left with nothing but these coagulation factors. So you are hypercoagulable. Right before you hit that anticoagulant state, you're hypercoagulable. You have to know that well. Okay, those are your anticoagulants. There's a pathway that I haven't talked about yet, and that is the fibrinolytic pathway. So we can use this pathway if there's a acute clot. So if a patient has like a stroke, has a giant clot in their brain, we can increase this pathway to try and break down that clot. So we can give them TPA, we can give them things that resemble TPA like alteplase. These all end in ACEs because they're enzymes um, that turn plasm plasminogen into plasmin. So you give them all this and the side effect is gonna be bleeding as with all of these. Uh, if you wanna reverse it, very important you know, the reversal agent is, so a reversal agent, amino caproic acid. Amino caproic acid stops the process and therefore uh, reverses it if you're giving too much of it. Now that was a lot of information. A lot of students have uh, memory aids to help them memorize the key facts. I just want to demonstrate how I memorize the key facts. Maybe you find it helpful, maybe not, we'll see. The, the pathway with the most, I guess, factors is gonna be the test with the most letters. So because there's only two tests, one PTT and one PT, this would be PTT, and this would be by default PT. I didn't write the T's in lowercase for no apparent reason. I actually write that all the time because it looks and resembles an H. So I know this is PTT, and it helps monitor heparin. This by default then would monitor warfarin. And then finally PT is another acronym for personal trainer which works on your external appearance. So external or extrinsic. By default this would mean this would be the extrinsic pathway. And that's how I remember this is, this is the extrinsic pathway. We work on it with heparin and we monitor the results with PTT. This is the extrinsic pathway. We work on it with warfarin. We monitor results with PT. That's how I memorize it. Is that dumb? Yes, but it works for me. And if it works, then it's not really that dumb. So I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.